<laughs> oh, Professor. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. No problem. I'm no, no problem. No problem. Thank um, you. I'm, you I'm joining you. from Thank South you. Korea, so I'm really okay. sorry. It's now so nice. nice. So nice. Wonderful. You're welcome. This is nice. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to City Prime News. We are live from our studio at Number 11, Dr. Morton Luke in Adaraka, Accra. This bulletin is also live on all our partners. Okay. I know my friend should be waiting for me right now. Manu, mm -hmm. why do you leave over from this same distance? Eh? Why do you see me up to my watch? There is nothing, just that I have so many things to take care of. 
Things like what? <laughs> Do not worry yourself. Very soon you get to know. Okay? I have to let you go now. So I can run along. It's okay if you say so. Just do it again. You too. I love you. That's <laughs> 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 oh, 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 Hello, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me, please? Good afternoon. good afternoon. We can hear you. Good, 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 good. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We can all hear you. We can hear you, please. Very good. Now that everybody can hear me, everyone is Thank you very much. I hear no microphone now. Um, good afternoon again to all of you. I think it's a global. So good morning and good evening to my friends in Australia. Good day to everyone. You are mostly welcome to the second edition. Somebody just still has the microphone on. Yes, you are welcome to the second in the monthly series of our mental health promotion seminar, virtual. This seminar is entitled Recent Ritual and Spousal Matters, the Mental Health Dimensions. Uh, first of all, let me apologize for the late start of the program. We had some technical issues here. Um, my name is Dr. Yao Amankwa Atha, the head of the mental health promotion of the Mental Health Authority. Before we move on, let me give a brief synopsis of what is going on now. And I just picked one paper, that is the Ghanaian Times, to look at issues with what we are going to discuss. On the 10th of March, the Ghanaian Times reported man in court over alleged murder of wife. Faith, it reported woman allegedly murdered in hotel room at Kokomemle. On the 11th, the same paper, a catching not why a deputy director allegedly beats girlfriend to death. Just the day before yesterday, another paper, Ghanaian Chronicle, reported woman slashes husband's neck with machete. These issues are very concerning and worrying. 
that is why we chose this topical issue because this is not this is only just from one paper. Other papers reported similar incidents. So to do justice to this topical issues, we have assembled a panel of experts in academia, in research, in practice over this issue who would help us to have a better understanding of what actually is going on and what we can do to help ourselves. Let me introduce the panel that we have. The first is our own CEO, Professor Akwesio I mean, his expertise in academia, practice and research. The evidence is out there, he's seasoned. Uh, we also have Dr. Joanna Larry Efuchi. She is a clinical psychologist, as well as a lecturer at the University of Ghana, Legon, and a consultant to national and international organizations providing psychosocial support and mental health issues. We also have Dr. Edgar Techi Akuno. He is also a lecturer at the University of Cape Coast in the Department of Sociology. He also has expertise in criminal justice and criminology. Another panel of member is Dr. Yanuso Malou. He is also a specialist psychiatrist, a part-time lecturer at the UDS Medical School, Kintampo College of Health and Wembley, and Radford University at East Legon. We also have Mrs. Daiwil Area, where she is the principal program officer and water regional director for the Department of Gender under the Ministry of Gender, Children, and Social Protection. Ladies and gentlemen, this are the panel of experts that we have assembled to help us digest this issue. Before we proceed, let me quickly uh, list a few housekeeping rules, uh, which as at this moment, I think everybody is obeying that you should keep mute your microphones. And uh, when we get to the question and answer session, participants will be invited after they have raised their hands and uh, we plead that you make your questions as clear, concise, and as short as possible. And within the context of the issue that we are discussing. We are also in a mental health space. So I would plead again that you be sensitive in your comments and your questions. Thank you for listening to me at this point. At this point, I'll invite the Chief Executive Officer, Professor Apesio Seng, to give us a brief welcome address, then the program can fully begin. Prof, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nankwa, and um, good afternoon and good day, depending on where we are coming from. I see Nana said to you from uh, Korea and it's evening there. So good day to everybody, and we are happy we have met once again at this session. Spousal abuses, spousal um, uh, uh, murders, homicides, these are issues that are common elsewhere, but unfortunately are also becoming common in our environment. We need to understand, far too often, we look at the criminal component of it without recognizing that there might be real issues of mental health and we need to understand. Indeed, sometimes it may be a reflection of the stress level of the society. So these are issues you really want to understand. What are the parts that mental health can play and therefore how can we intervene? So we are happy that we are all here. We have a team of, um, assembled a team of crack uh, speakers and all be able to delve into this issue so that at the end of the day, 
we can have an understanding for ourselves and not only that, so that probably we can put in some measures of intervention to reduce this um, unfortunate phenomenon in our, in our country and elsewhere. On that note, I want to say thank you all very much and let it be as interactive as possible when it's open for interaction. Thank you. Over, can yeah. Thank you very uh, much, Prof, for this short welcome address. Um, straight to action now. I'll go straight to a psychiatrist among the panel. Dr. Maluk. Yes, Dr. Hello, Atta. Dr. Good afternoon to you and good afternoon to everyone. Good, good, good. Um, can you please provide us a brief context of this issue based on your expertise? Okay, Dr. Atta, thank you very much. And good afternoon to you all once again. Spousal matters and ritual matters. I mean, anytime we hear of spouses, we think of, we think of love, one partner and the other didn't love. But we sometimes forget that there are other issues in spousal relationships, i.e. misunderstandings and conflicts that can sometimes lead to violent reactions and sometimes lead to these murders that we witness. And with spousal murders, usually one of the partners may suffer from depression. And this could lead to um, um, this, this situation whereby especially the man could then eventually kill the partner. For instance, if the man is a breadwinner of the family and then is depressed and feels that, okay, if he loses his life, who would then take care of the family? Or it feels that if he dies, somebody else would then take care of, or would take over the wife and then, you know, be with him. So he will end up taking his own life and also taking the life of the wife. Also, there's something I want to term as morbid jealousy. Sometimes, especially the men, may have this what we call morbid jealousy. Sometimes it might even be a delusion. And if somebody asks, I could go into that. You know, having the belief that somebody else is sleeping with the partner. And this could eventually lead to misunderstandings and conflicts that can lead to, you know, um, murder or homicide, as the case may be. Um, let me move on to ritual murders. For ritual murders, usually it is out of greed. And in Ghana, yeah, I mean, most people want to get rich quick, especially the youth. And out of this greed, they get or they fall prey to certain quick rich schemes that we see on the media, radio, television, it's all over. And eventually they fall prey to these things. But for the mental health dimension, I mean, somebody who is grandiose, I mean, that's a form of delusion. About being rich, could eventually get involved in some of these things. Also, people who easily succumb to such suggestions about getting rich, they already had these ideas or ambitions to get rich. So when they see these things being shown on TV all the time, they may end up succumbing to it and getting involved in this and, 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 and murders. Finally, let me just um, conclude with this as my introductory remarks. Sometimes people also have this delusion or apart from delusion, they, they may have hallucinations, voices telling them to kill people for ritual purposes. So somebody who is psychotic and is having this hallucination telling that kill this person for a, a ritual or for a police purpose could end up killing somebody else. What I for a, a, a ritual purpose, the person was really ill, you know, and this could result in the murder. So okay. these are my introductory okay. remarks about that. Thank you very much, Dr. Maluk, for this insight. Uh, let's, let's hear what the, psych, the clinical psychologist also has to say about this. Dr. Joanna, what is your take on this? Okay, good. Good afternoon to you all. I'm grateful for the opportunity. Like um, Prof. Akresio said, mentioned, 
um, spousal abuse is becoming very common in our society. And from practice, we realize that it has even become more with COVID stresses. And, and so coping has become very difficult for people and people are in the act of um, abusing to leading to um, murder. I see spousal murder as a graduation from verbal, emotional and physical abuse. And for a very long time, our focus has been on discussing uh, the victim. So I believe that that narrows our perspective on the issue. And also it also um, lessens the magnitude of the issue. Perhaps looking at the perpetrator's attributes in line with the victim's action may give us a broader perspective about the issue and then give us an in-depth in the magnitude of the issues that we are dealing with. So perpetrators like um, Dr. Maluk started saying, perpetrators may be people who have developed deep-seated psychological issues as a result of probably their experiences or their makeup. I see still on researches that I came oh, across across cultures oh, I'm have established that perpetrators are usually oh, first of all manipulative. And because of this attribute, they are able to they manage to Dr. make Dr. a big Dr. Dr. Jana, please hold on for me. Dr. Jana, please hold on for me. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please may I remind all participants to switch. Or mute their microphones. We have interruptions. Please mute your microphones for us. There's so much distraction. I think the host, the host room can mute everybody. Can mute everybody, and then the speaker would unmute herself. All right, Dr. Drana, please go on. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, yeah, sorry for the interruption. Dr. Donna, please take over now. Hello, Dr. Donna.
Okay, thank you very much. I couldn't unmute because it was disabled. So I'll continue from um, the, across. These researches have established that perpetrators are usually, first of all, manipulative and attributes um, makes them let the victim feel that they deserve what is happening to them. And so even though the victim knows that whatever is going on is not suitable for them, they can't leave. That's why the difficulty. So they are manipulative. And secondly, they are controlling. This attribute also uh, makes them take charge of all aspects of the victim's life. So they can break their social networks. They break their self-esteem and confidence. Sometimes even they break their economic power. And these also place some fear in the victim because they are disempowered to take charge of their own lives. And then thirdly, what came out strongly is that often perpetrators see themselves as victims. And so the, their behavior of abuse is reinforced. So um, they, they harm the uh, victim. Aside these attributes of the perpetrator, too, we need to understand the pattern or cycle of abuse to be able to appreciate the situation better. So the pattern of abuse usually begins with, it's a cycle. So it begins with probably tension within the relationship. And then the verbal attacks uh, increases, a stand-up phase where verbal attacks, emotional abuse increases. Then there is an explosion where the, the perpetrator perpetrates violent acts on the victim. Now at the explosion phase, you realize that with time, the, the nature of violence graduates from bad to worse. That is when at a point uh, the, the, they can be able to maim their victims or even murder their victims. Soon after that, the perpetrator shows remorse. And this remorse is, is rather uh, tricky because the perpetrator begins to rationalize his behavior, most times shifting the blame to the victim saying that if you had not done this, I wouldn't have also done that to you. And, and so you realize that even though uh, he's, he's uh, sort of showing remorse and probably apologizing, he's not taking responsibility for what he has done, but shifting the blame back on the victim. Then at that phase, they begin to make promises, I will not do that again and all that. Then a honeymoon phase also comes in where there is a brief, a respite of abuse, from abuse. Uh, everything seemed to be going on very well. And um, before long, another uh, tension built up and the cycle continues. What I want us to note here is that from the remorse phase to the honeymoon phase, you realize that the, 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 the phases create some sort of confusion within the victim's mind. Because after the person has showed remorse, the victims begin to real, rationalize that, well, after all, my partner is not bad. Before you realize another phase of tension building begins. And subsequently, like I said, at the explosion stage, the, the abuse gets complicated. So the victim is maimed or murdered. Now, over time, you realize that the attributes of the perpetrator and the continued cycle or pattern of this abuse expose the victim to um, psychological difficulties. So you realize that fear set in and sometimes get complicated. So you realize that anxiety disorders may set in confusion or distorted thoughts in, on the part of the victim set in. Uh, there is damage to the self-worth of the individual. Now the individual may feel isolated and then subsequently depressed. Then helplessness sets in. At this stage, um, of helplessness, even when help is suggested, action on the part of the victim becomes very difficult because now the, the thought is that I deserve what I'm going through. Um, I don't have any self-worth. I can't take initiative. My life is sort of controlled. And that is where um, I, I would end here. So what I want us to realize is that uh, perpetrators have deep-seated psychological difficulties, which um, make the victims believe that they deserve 
what they are going through, and um, at a point get helpless um, in, in, in um, the relationship. And so they can't act out to seek support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Joanna, for that detailed perspective about spousal mothers. I mean, the mental health dimension, it's clear from the two explanations provided by Dr. Joanna and Dr. Malouk. I think uh, we'll hear the perspective of the gender advocates. Ms. Dywell. Yes, Hello, good afternoon. Ms. Yes, please, Doc. I'm here. Please, can you hear me? Can yes, you hear me, can. please? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, we can. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to the panel. Good afternoon to all our listeners. So I am coming from the gender dimension. And as we all know, gender. It's social. Please, there is some noise. Doc, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Madam Daiwo. Okay. Uh, so, those of you who just joined, can you please mute your microphone? Your back there. Um, I'm going to start with the Yeah, how are you? Why am I to say? Those of you who are just joined, can you please mute your microphone? Please mute your microphone. On and off. Hey, what is on and off? What is on and off? Doctor, you Doctor, Doctor, you you go ahead and mute people, and then the speaker will be mute. Please, those of you just join us, can you mute your microphone for us, please? Please, administrator, can you mute everybody? Others are not very Mute everybody. Okay. Okay, so coming from the gender perspective, um, we take gender as a social construct. And when you look theoretically, um, there is um, a social cognitive theory behind how children particularly are raised, how behavior and character is imbibed. And this goes a long way to shape our actions, inactions, and behavior. Now, when you look from the gendered perspective, you will say that all the spousal murders that we have witnessed so far, they are against women. In gender socialization, sometimes we socialize our male children physically, psychologically, to be strong, to be brave, aggressive, to be breadwinners. And so these children grow with this mindset, particularly the boys. And so with this kind of socialization, sometimes you may develop children into um, a certain character trait, which may be toxic. So in gender, we may say that we develop certain toxic masculinities. For example, a boy who is taught that you have to be aggressive. He, is, he becomes daring. He becomes very aggressive sometimes. He sees aggression as a way of power and dominance. And so in a relationship, that dominance must be brought to bear. On the other hand, we socialize the girls to be prim and proper to be gentle, to be friendly. And so fighting back becomes an anomaly to them. And then from also the gender perspective, we realize that children imbibe a lot from the home, from their parents, 
the behavior, the character that is shown by parents at home becomes a character trait for some of these children to emulate. And research has shown that in a home where there is abuse and violence, children grow up to one, become perpetrators. They may become perpetrators or they may even become subservient and recipients of violence, particularly girls. A boy who is raised in an abusive environment, seeing the parents fight every day, see fighting, psychologically, it becomes a normal for him. So once that child grows up, that role of dominance, of being the stronger one, of being the head, it's misinterpreted and misused. And when you look at our context in Ghana, for example, and you look at domestic violence issues that come up, assault, for example, is one of the highest, if not the most highest. And when you look at the trend of assault, you realize that women are victims. Over 80% of women are victims, whilst about 20% or 19% of men are victims. And even when you analyze the victim's perspective, you realize that some of these male victims are recipients from other male uh, colleagues. And so in gender, we homogenize men as strong, powerful, um, must exert power. And so this upbringing, this thought, this behavior lives with them, some men, I wouldn't generalize, live with some men, and then it is brought into a relationship. And so with the relationship, because the woman is also socialized to be submissive, Sometimes they are not empowered enough to leave the relationship when they ought to. They are not empowered enough to speak up. Sometimes um, economic situation, family situation, there are certain gendered narratives that we also do. And these narratives also go a long way to shape some of these people staying in abuse relationship. And over time, this abuse, as the psychologist said, may degenerate into further abuse and unfortunately may lead to murder. When it comes to the ritual murder, it also has a gendered perspective to it. Sometimes poverty. We have spoken a lot about adolescent. We can't hear. Madam Dawa, please unmute yourself. Thank you. So, when they see some of these things on the media, that is purportedly good enough to empower them financially to have that space as a man who is well to do. A man, remember I said gender is a social construct. So society is looking at him as a real man by the proof of your wealth. And so if you can kill to get that power, to get that recognition by society, you do it to get that money. And some of them may think that, oh, women like money, which may not be all the truth. But because of that social perspective that women must depend on men for their financial sustenance, they think they tend to think that way. If I have money, I can get whatever I want. I can get any woman I want. And so they go in that direction. And some of these children end up in this kind of behavior. And like the little ones we saw from Kaswa, end up killing somebody just to get that recognition of being a real man, a rich man who can take care of his home, who can take care of the children. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Madam Daiwa, for that exposition. Um, we would like to hear from the sociologists and then we'll put all into context. Dr. Akono. Hello, good afternoon. Yes, Dr. Akono, good afternoon. Okay, thank you very much um, for the opportunity. These are very critical issues that I think we should applaud the mental health unit for bringing it to the fore. A lot has been said by the four speakers about some of the causes of spousal and ritual murder. But if we want to put it in perspective, I want to say that this is a phenomenon that occasionally gets reported in the country. We have a long history of spousal and other ritual related murders. Those of us who could remember around 1998 down to 2000, almost 34 women were ritually uh, allegedly murdered. And it was very difficult as a nation for us to unravel the reasons, the rationale behind those women, why the person singled out women. Occasionally, we also hear about ritual murders. Uh, if you remember around Suhum some years back, around, uh, I've forgotten the exact period. Now, some data suggests that right from 1998 up to uh, currently, about now, we've had more than 100 plus spousal related incidents that have been reported. Note, these are the ones that we have been reported in the print media. Unfortunately, we don't have a very coherent data collection system. So normally we rely on those ones that are reported in the media space with the help of the print and electronic media. So somehow it's, it's, it's quite in our society. And sometimes depending on the kind of investigation that will be conducted, the numbers can be higher or it can be lower. So it's an issue that is part of our history that we need to look at in them and see our way forward. Now, if you talk about spousal murders, we have had a number of reasons and I want to induce a couple of social related reasons that uh, I think uh, we need to look at. One is the cultural acceptance of wife discipline or the fact that a man can discipline a woman once they are in a certain relationship. Sometimes our culture treats women as infants. So they can be spanned, they can be chastised, they can be rebuked. The same cannot be said of men. So just as we've heard, uh, so when we enter relationship, we go into the relationship with the same mindset you have the right to discipline, uh, chastise your wife, but wife do not have the same uh, leverage in terms of dealing with their counterpart. So that cultural acceptance should be an area where we need to look at. Now, another socio-economic related issue is the kind of employment outcomes. When people have poor employment outcomes, joblessness, they are not getting much. It generates a lot of argument. It can result in needless spousal abuse and then escalating to murder. We've also noted that drugs and alcohol can be a factor because sometimes when people ingest some of these drugs, it affects their mindset. It affects their ability to see things the way they need to see it. Now, one of the things that unfortunately I've not heard anybody highlighting is sexual refusal. That the men want to have their way and the woman says no. And then no for some obvious reasons, you've not performed your right, your responsibilities as a man. Uh, so somehow women want to use this as a way to discipline. That, I mean, that's their biggest weapon. That arouses that kind of anger. And we've had so many cases where uh, because of sexual refusal, uh, people have been killed. Now, let me also underscore the fact that we can also have spousal murder as a result of abuse, what we call a uh, battered person syndrome. Now, sometimes when people 
are in abusive relationship. It becomes a routine, whether the man or the woman, at every point in time, he comes home and then the other partner becomes a punching bag. Now it can get to a point where now this person, this victim will say enough is enough. And then something bad happens. Just decide that this is the end of the road. Stops, shoots, etc. The easy access to weapons. Now our society is getting weaponized. With least provocation, people are drawing guns. That is a serious recipe when it comes to the domestic setting. That if you have people who have not been able to manage their emotions well and they have guns at home, the probability or the propensity to draw or resort to violence and lethal violence is very high. For spousal murder, sometimes we've also noticed inability for individuals to resolve their own issues, problems. When people have personal problems, sometimes they don't really face them the way they need to face them. And they tend to blame their partners for their predicament. Oh, you are a witch. You are the reason why I'm going through all these. Therefore, when you are no more, I think I'll have some good luck. So it, it's connected to the whole essence of individuals being able to manage their own issues well. Now for ritual methods, uh, I've not been around for too long, but at least for close to five decades that I've been around. When we were children, around festivals and when chiefs die, our parents will warn us. We felt that this chief is gone, therefore be careful. When you go out and somebody calls you, please don't go because there's what we call uh, heart harvesters or attitude coma. I don't know whether some of you are, they are around, so be careful. So somehow these, we, we don't have the data to support that really when the chief died, somebody are compared all these things are, but that notion is there. So for occasions like some of our traditional events, funerals for very big prominent chiefs, there's always the suspicion that ritual methods do occur not well verified, probably we have to find out and uh, get the data to support that. Another thing that is culminating in the high level of ritual meta is the need for power, fame, money. People are going at all length to ensure that they can accrue some level of power, fame, and money, whether as business executives, whether as politicians, even pastors will go at any length to make sure that their churches are prominent, they are prosperous, irrespective of the consequences. And these are some of the reasons why that is triggering the high incidence of ritual murders. There's an element I want to flag because I'm coming from the criminology background. Now we have organ harvesting. So if we are talking about murdering people for rituals, now people are also being killed because their organs are needed for transplant. So that aspect should be considered very critically, especially the investigation and the forensic aspect so that at least we can determine which ones are ritual methods, uh, money rituals or whatever, and which ones are for organ harvesting. I think that has to be considered. We also have to look at previous experience. I'm talking about displacement here. When we say displacement, when people have had experience of ritual murders elsewhere, if they've done it elsewhere and they are successful, and now it happens to be the case that there is a, a security operation somewhere, and for that reason, they cannot do it where they used to do it, they look for other alternative. Now we live in a sub-region where we have stories about all kinds of people doing all kinds of things. We've seen them in films and uh, whatever. So, if these individuals can get to other areas where these things are not happening, and they have previous experience of having been successful in those crimes, definitely they can engage in these activities. Societal expectation. I'm talking about societal expectation because now power and fame is the norm, money is the norm. So get rich quick is driving people to do everything to make sure that uh, they get power. I also want to talk about peer norms. 
we all work in the same facility. We all work in the same uh, environment. You have V8, I don't have V8. What is the reason? What do you do different that you don't have? My friend, how did you get your V8? Say so you, are, you, you are joking, you sit here and do that. So somehow we are influencing, the peer influence is there. We may be adults, but since you work in the same setting, the same environment with someone, and the person seems to be doing it and you don't seem to be doing it. Definitely it can result in people looking for alternative. And that is the reason why we are seeing a lot of court practices. Because if you can not get it through the formal system, the legitimate system, and there's an alternative, you must innovate. That's what in criminology you say, innovation. So far as it doesn't hurt anybody, then you have to go along with it. So in Maine, we may want to say that, I may want to say that these are very critical. If I may draw the final one on the spousal method, I want to highlight what I call ungoverned spaces. Now, if we talk about ritual methods, why is it going on? Why do they occur? And where do they occur? There are so many things going on in our country that somehow we wait till it gets out of hand before we start acting. Meanwhile, we have laws, we have legislations, we have statutes that can be used to bring down these things. Let me give an example. This is not to malign any group of people. Let's look at the Okada and then the, the other one. Uh, what is the name? Okada and the other one. Phenomenon. Recently, I was at Adenta. I was almost knocked down by a motorbike. Because I know the terrain very well, but unfortunately, I didn't know that the pavement and the walkways have been turned into Okada streets. And unknowingly, they wouldn't even mind. I mean, they were just speeding. Who is supposed to govern these spaces for us? Are we waiting for something nasty to happen? And that is exactly where probably a lot of people are now questioning our media landscape. That now we have been able to project all kinds of things that used to be done in secrecy to the point that now once people see these things in national media highlighted at that level, it may sound like there's some truth. It may give credence to the fact that it is good because if it is permitted on national television, why is it bad? And that is where I say that there are certain spaces we have to look at again and govern properly. Other than that, we should stand, uh, we should be ready for more of those things. Uh, I think I said last one, but I think I forgot. Mere exposure, exposure is key. When people get exposed to all kinds of criminal acts, all kinds of uh, deviant behaviors, when they need, they may put it into practice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Akuno. Uh, time is really running fast for us, but uh, we'll still keep you on. Prof, are you there? Yes, I am. Very good. I mean, looking, listening to the interesting perspectives that has been shared, what common thread do you find among all of them? What do you make of all these perspectives? Yeah, thank you very much. Let me add a few and then, but these are very interesting perspectives that are coming. Uh, we talked about the mental health component, depression, and there are other mental health issues that we need to look at. Somebody may simply be paranoid, paranoid schizophrenia, in which the person feels that somebody or the rest of the world is against him or her. And if the object of the paranoia happens to be the spouse, then God save us. So paradise schizophrenia in the perpetrator is something we need to look at. Delusional disorder, there is something, a phenomenon called delusional disorder where the person simply feels he has a certain fixated belief which you cannot rule or you cannot uproot. Even if you bring evidence to the contrary, the person seems still fixated and other people near him of his social, cultural, educational background don't hold it. And he gets so fixated that he can actually act on that. So again, if the object of the delusion happens to be the spouse, then we are dead. This is, we hear of bipolar disorder, thanks to the media. Now bipolar disorder is becoming quite commonly known. And bipolar disorder, earlier, uh, one of the speakers mentioned mania, and then uh, another depression. So if the two come together, bipolar 
that could also be a factor in the perpetrator to perpetrate this, this phenomenon. Personality disorder. Somebody with, a, like we say, a, the antisocial personality disorder or dissocial, uh, somebody with this phenomenon may perpetrate a crime, spousal abuse, spousal, spousal murder, without any sense of remorse. To him, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. We need to look at that. There is another phenomenon that I think we need to recognize. Indeed, we also have masochism sadism, which is, which is a sexual orientation disorder. Somebody feels that I only get my satisfaction by inflicting pains on my partner, sadism, or my partner inflicting pains on me, masochism. Now, if a couple happens to have this phenomenon in them, then as one of the speakers said, it might escalate. Then the escalation might eventually lead to this phenomenon of a spousal, a spousal uh, a murder. But I must also say that victim might also have some circumstances in him or situation, situations in him or her that might provoke the perpetrator. It does not justify the perpetrator from uh, 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 perpetrating it, but it would also have triggered this phenomenon. So the victim may also have these conditions that we've mentioned, the mental disorders and others, and the perpetrator is unable to withstand it, then it can lead to that. Then somebody not being able to manage his or her temperament. I keep saying that anger, you didn't create your anger, you didn't create your temperament, but how you manage that temperament, that is solely your responsibility. So somebody may be very temperamental, and if we have not recognized and helped him to manage the anger, then it can escalate to a point where he may perpetrate this kind of um, uh, injustice or murder in the partner, and we need to recognize that. Uh, in all this, we, and I must also say that the vulnerability of the victim is also very important. Somebody who is assertive is not likely to stand this condition, but if it's vulnerable for one reason or the other, and we've had some of them financially, you are subservient to the partner, so you are vulnerable, and this may lead to that. And the victim might acquire what you call learned helplessness. The person feels he's so helpless that he has to remain in the phenomenon. And you know, the society also tells you that you can't leave. No, no, no. I mean, it's, it's shame to leave your marriage. I'm not saying that you should encourage divorce. But on the other hand, if it gets to a certain point where it might be safer to walk away, the society will also say, no, you can't walk away. It's shameful. Uh, in my family, nobody has ever divorced. And, and then it becomes, then the person acquires this phenomenon of learned helplessness. So he remains in it, and then eventually this is what happens. So these are things that we need to recognize. But at the bottom of it all, line, you realize that the perpetrator's factor and the victim's factor might play a lot of role. And some of these issues, if you had recognized them early, the mental health component, we probably would have been able to, to build their resilience, manage it early, and get them to be off it. Of course, I'm not saying that everything is mental. We, we, the sociologists and others have come in to get us to recognize that social, cultural factors play a lot of role. And this might have nothing to do with mental health companies. But we need to recognize all this so that as we attempt to address, we put them all in perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Indeed, you have really summed it up well. And clearly, the mental health component, the social and cultural component also plays a role in spaza and ritual murders. And indeed, something needs to be done. I think I'll go straight to the psychiatrist. Mr. Maluk, what are the telltale signs that we can we can that can tell us that something is going on? What can we do? Okay, Dr. Asa, thank you very much. And thank you, Professor Apisio Sai, for touching on a number of the mental health disorders. I mean, so talking about schizophrenia, I mean, if the person is paranoid, you know, uh, that's a form of a delusion. They exhibit about people being against him or plotting against him. So for instance, if you are in a marriage and you have your partner, always being suspicious of you without any evidence to it, you should be worried. You should seek for help for him. 
or hair, as the case may be. Um, alcohol abuse or substance abuse. You know, if your partner abuses alcohol a lot, you should also be worried because this eventually leads to um, 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 problems and then can lead to misunderstandings and conflicts and can also lead to violence and then murder. Let me talk more about the alcohol. Studies have shown that men who are dependent on alcohol, about 60 to 70 percent of them have sexual problems. And like Dr. Akono said, that's our sociologist. Sexual problems can result in misunderstanding, which can lead to to an um, 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 murder or so, spousal murder. So substance abuse, alcohol abuse, particularly, is something that you, the partner, should be concerned about. And let me add that people who have violent tendencies, violent tendencies, you should be careful or you should worry. So whatever you can do to look for help for your partner, look for it. Talk to someone. Talk to a mental health expert. And if you feel the abuse is becoming too much, don't stay in it because you are afraid of what the society will tell you. So somebody with a history of violence, you should, you should be worried. Now I'm coming to depression. I mean, if you realize that your partner is always down, seem not to be happy, withdrawn, suicidal, and all this, you should be worried and you should seek for help, you know? I mean, so in a nutshell, I mean, I'll just end there by saying that when we see some of these signs or symptoms, we should be worried that then we should seek for help. Talk to somebody, ask for help. Thank you very much, Dr. Maluk. Indeed, we should seek for help because there is help out there. Dr. Joanna, from your practice, and picking up from what Professor said with regards to the vulnerability of the woman, I guess that when the woman is empowered to a certain extent, if she's assertive, she would be able to deal decisively with the situation. What would you advise family members, friends, and network to do to help this woman in such a situation? If indeed she is bold enough to confide in them that this is the kind of situation she is in, which definitely, which would most likely lead to uh, serious consequences. What would you advise, Dr. Okay, Joanna? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm wondering why you are uh, focusing only on the women, um, because at least our gender expert made us aware that men, uh, some men also go through the same. So you realize that none of us is immune to abuse. So caution uh, goes to us and also to our, our growing uh, children as well. So I believe that first of all, we have a duty as mental health authority to lead the, the empowering of everyone in the nation. And this move is a very critical, a very good one. So we need to, each one of us need to empower ourselves with information on abuse. So what is, what is abuse? How does it present the impact, opportunities to seek support and so on? Let's empower ourselves with information, as much information as possible on abuse. And then we also need to empower ourselves on speaking out. Dr. Maluk said that let's speak out, but I have, uh, in practice, I have a difficulty when it comes to um, speaking out. In practice, the challenge has been from my clients, the challenge has been that some uh, relationship counselors trivialize the issue in the first place and make it seem very normal. And that compound opportunity to speak out. So if we want to speak out, let's train our relationship counselors Relationship counseling or marriage counseling, it's, it's um, an expertise on its own. And so you don't um, just do it. You do it with some training. Don't say that, for instance, tell somebody who comes to you to um, seek support that, 
oh, that is how it's, it's always been. Oh, that is how it is. Go, and then you pray about it. It will go. Yes, praying is very important, but also helping the person to um, take certain action is also very critical, especially when the abuse keeps compounding. And um, also, uh, let's seek um, support from um, trained experts. If, if um, you are not sure of who to go to, just there are a lot of, if you go to mental health authority, they will direct you. Uh, Ghana Psychological Association, we also have a um, group of people who specialize in uh, relationship counseling. We can uh, direct you to that. Aside that, let's all be each other's keeper. We, we are a social support now. Now we realize that the situation keeps getting, um, growing from bad to worse. And so each one of us have a responsibility towards um, our cohorts. So let's be sensitive to especially subtle, and um, what we, we, we will trivialize, subtle changes and pronounced ones that occur in um, our colleagues and our loved ones. Let's be sensitive to it. Let's be concerned so that if we see these changes, we can make the move first of all to uh, find out what is happening. We should bear in mind that if you are judgmental, if you trivialize those issues, the person will not open up. And so let's work on ourselves so that we will not be judgmental. Let's work on ourselves so that uh, people can be able to freely confide in us so that the, the burden of um, not speaking will be lifted off the shoulders of, of uh, 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 friends and loved ones. Uh, what I want us to know, note is that each situation uh, usually is handled in context. Each uh, spousal uh, abuse is handled in context. And so if you have offered your support uh, to a level that you think you can't go on any longer, please lead the person to a specialist. That one, I'm very passionate about it. Don't carry on with the, the, the uh, counseling or support if you think that you are unable to do it. Just release the person to an expert to uh, support better or direct the person to an avenue to seek support. And I think that, that uh, if we all take up these responsibilities, it will help us so much. Um, the, a quick one on the ritual murder. I forgot to um, say something on it. Let me quickly add. Growing up, we were socialized um, in an extended family system where values were built in our social, uh, within the socialization process. Now, where are the values? Are we losing the values? Have we lost the values? We need to come back to reassess where these values have gone. So um, what role, for instance, can um, now uh, socialization is gradually shifting because parents feel that um, the, the blame is all often given to um, economic hardship. And more or less, most parents have, have shifted the burden on um, teachers or trainers of our young, young ones. So we should bear in mind that there is a role our educational system can play in imbibing certain values as Ghanaians within us. Uh, what are our motivations? I think um, our sociologists mentioned that we hail people who are rich without looking at the source. So what is our motivation? What are the um, um, responsibilities attached to these uh, motivations? Let's rethink this um, very well. And the supervision, yes, the, the economic hardship um, is blamed. And so we are escaping, parents are escaping from supervision. But the truth of the matter is that we are seeking these economic uh, fortunes because of these same uh, children that uh, we have given birth to. So we should give ourselves, we should create systems that have an oversight responsibility whilst pursuing our economic uh, pursuits. Uh, we should also find avenues to supervise who is with, with your children, who are they hanging yeah. out, what are they telling them, what are they watching. All these things are things that we should go back to the drawing board to rethink and then come back and implement. Thank you very much. Wow, that's quite an extensive 
solution that you've provided there. Picking up from a few things that you did mention with regards to responsibility, uh, I would refer it to Madam Daiwell. Madam Daiwell, when it comes to responsibility, I think that in, in our homes, we see the signs that some of these things abuses, which might lead to murder is going on. Elsewhere, you can report. Here, when you report, what is the impact? What is being done to encourage us to report when we see such things happening in somebody's house, the neighbor, all that? What is being done? But Thank I'm you very own. much, Doc. Um, when you look at our Domestic Violence Act, it provides the opportunity for different categories of people to report abuse and violence. And indeed, when the sociologist was speaking, he mentioned the fact that sometimes when people are in abusive relationship, they, they imbibe the abuse and become um, recipients of that abuse without making any efforts to get out of it and justify the abuse. Now, our laws have made provision that when such abuse are going on, it could be reported to the police, in which event they are supposed to investigate and find out what is happening. Where appropriate, they are supposed to provide a safe space for the victim, where she is protected from further abuse until the issue is resolved. Now we have realized that many people in the community, just yesterday we were in the community and they raised the same issue that if you go to report an abuse, you become the enemy. Now we have different opportunities available to us, apart from physically going to report an abuse. Currently, as we speak, because of the COVID, um, globally we realize that COVID has aggravated violence. And so there are other approaches that have been put in place to encourage reporting of such cases. One of them, for example, is Dofsu uh, initiating the hotline program where they have a hotline you can just call in and report what is going on and they find a way of getting through to you. Um, they have this uh, 055,900 where you can just report and get help. Currently, there is another intervention, which is the Orange Support Center by the Domestic Violence and uh, Support, Domestic Violence Secretariat of the Ministry, where you can just call 08001112222, and then you are linked to a support system. And I'm happy we are here discussing this issue today because as part of that center, there is also the app called the Buami app where the public can just go into Google store, they install the app, and then you find information and support when necessary. This information includes linking the victim or even the perpetrator to psychological counseling. And I believe that this is the root of a lot of the issues. If violence is reported on time, then the victim could receive psychological support that will help the victim break out of the violence relationship. Sometimes we say leave, leave the relationship, but it is a bit complicated. There are factors that keep people in the relationship. And so I believe that when we diversify the modes of reporting violence and abuse, it, it helps and then also providing the psychological bit early enough so that the victim does not stay in there, become very used to the abuse, cannot um, be, be self-confident to speak up, to report and so on. And so yes, right. we can report. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Darwell. Thank you very much, Darwell. Uh, as it's getting interesting, we are also running out of time. Uh, but um, Dr. Kono, let me ask you, 
currently we are teaching our children somehow to be wary of strangers. Now to the Katswa issue, we realize that the victim and the perpetrators, the alleged perpetrators knew each other. Now, when you put that together and asking our children to be wary of strangers, and even a clinical psychologist will tell you that in most abuses, the victim and the perpetrator know each other. Now, how do you, as a sociologist, how do you advise us, do we need to still keep our ideology on being wary of strangers or even those that we know? Right, thank you very much, Dr. Atta. And uh, if you can be snappy on that for me, I'll be very happy. Right. So the, because the, we need to we need we need to give the audience the opportunity to also ask right. a few questions. Okay. Right. The the issue is that you know in our local parlance they say that there's the trees that are closed that will get friction. In your bare nature. So uh, homicide, uh, in fact the perpetrators know themselves more than 50%. All those stranger uh, homicide and uh, related killings are also going up. Do we need to tell our children to be uh, careful with strangers? Actually, the caveat should rather be careful with people who try to be nice, whether they are strangers, because normally strangers repel. If you don't know someone, you will not easily accept the person. It takes a while for the person to get closer. But acquaintances, people we already know, pastors, teachers, uh, our cousins, etc., because of the familiarity, we assume certain things. But in security and criminology, rather, we should be careful with anybody who try to be nice. What it means is that even when you know the person, you still need to be careful and read the true intention and meaning of the behavior of that individual. Other than that, once we can say, that, okay, be careful with strangers. Once we meet people that we know, they fall into their arms and then the, 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 the unfortunate event happens. So I think the, the, the rule should be that even when somebody is nice, still be careful. And this is what we teach even our security people. If you are guarding wherever you are and somebody is trying to be overtly nice, you have to be very suspicious and be careful. Crisp and concise, thank you very much. I think that uh, we've done a pretty good job with this topic. Um, I would open the lines for our participants to ask a few questions before we run up. Professor Sayer would run up the whole program for us. So those who are interested in asking questions, and please may I advise that to make your questions straight to the point so that it be clear and we can ask our panelists. Hello. Hello, Patrick, go ahead. Hello, Patrick, go ahead. Hello, good afternoon, Doctor Amankwa. Please go ahead. Please, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Please, my just uh, I come with some humble suggestions. Um, since we are talking about uh, Spaza Meda, is it possible that we can invite them? A dog suit coordinator from the Ghana Police Service to also give us a highlight on that. Or even better, to a social welfare worker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Your suggestion is very much welcome and it to be considered. Thank you very much. Hello. 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 Good afternoon. Yes. Hello. Good afternoon. We can hear you. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, mine is also a humble suggestion. Um, I think that for programs like this, if we could use the webinar format instead, so that when people join, they don't have to mute their mics. We use the webinar format. Usually you have the panelists and then the participants. So those of us who are joining, we will join as participants with our mics already muted. And then the panelists can now control who can talk at which points in time. Because this really disrupts when people join and they are, they are not muting their mic. So I'm suggesting it. Also, if I can get the contact number that was given for the um, abuse victims to, to, to um, be able to link up to social support. I don't know if it can be put in the chat. I realize the chat has been disabled. So if it can be put in the chat or I can get the contacts some way, somehow. 
and I'll be grateful. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for your suggestions. And uh, no, I'm pretty sure that you will no. view it and take no. it into consideration. Thank you very much. No. Hello, doctor. Hello. Hello, doctor. This is uh, Hello, TV3. Hello, TV3. Hello, TV3. Hello, TV3. Yeah. Hello. Hello, doctor. Hello, doctor. Can you hear me? Hello, TV3. Go ahead. Okay, okay. So my my, my question is uh, to Professor Professor Osei. As the head of the the chief executive of the Mental Health Authority, as the sociologist was talking, he was talking about the inactive of legislations in the country about the racial uh, the ritual methods and the um, spousal methods. As a professor, are you uh, can you recommend any um, law or are you aware of any law that is inactive and are you willing to recommend any law to curb these parties in the country? Hello, Prof. Hello. Yes, thank yes, you. Prof. Yes, yes uh, please go ahead. To start with, I think you need to keep close eyes on muting where the noise is always coming from. You can, if, if you look at the participant chat, you can always know where the noise is coming from, either you mute it. Um, yeah, now on this very question, as for laws, <laughs> I'll show you, I don't, I keep saying that maybe the only law you don't have in Ghana is the law that says implement any law that is passed. <laughs> as for the laws, they are there, but our inability to implement them, that's our problem. So I take your call to being, how can you make sure that the laws that are already there, and I don't think we need to create another one, the laws that are already there are implemented. So continuous engagement, and this is a good opportunity for us all to come together. And then you follow up and see where you need to get the police, get the dossier, get all those areas. But the laws already exist. That one, I, I think I'm sure. The dossier, uh, um, the gender, military, whatever. Laws are there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Doctor, can I also come in? Yes, Sorry. Nana, please come in. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, my question is, um, I think um, Dr. Joanna Larry Efutu said something at the beginning of her remarks. Um, he said, she said that um, the current murders and whatever we are seeing now is a reflection of the stress level of the society. And I want to find out what is the stress level of Ghana now? Secondly, um, what services or what help is given to the perpetrators after they have been arrested? Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Dr. Joanna. Okay, so um, I don't remember saying that, but um, I know that uh, COVID-19 COVID has come with several stresses. Um, we, our routines have changed. Most of our routines, have, our work schedules have changed. Uh, we have to adapt to uh, using computers to work. Um, at the University of Ghana, I'm a lecturer. And if you look at students alone, the stresses they have to go through the, the, with technology. Even here, look at the stress that we've been through. So the change in lifestyle has gradually, we, we need to adapt to the new change in lifestyle. And that alone is quite stressful. Some people who already have, um, for instance, some psychological issues, example, anxiety disorders have heightened anxieties. Some people didn't used to have anxiety anxieties, but are now, um, ha now have heightened anxiety levels. And so there are several things around us that makes us prone to um, stress. People have lost their jobs. People have to uh, be in the house uh, parents have to be working and taking care of children who are doing online lessons. All these things compound, uh, have compounded our stress levels. It also comes with costs. So for instance, if you have three uh, children who are doing online, you have to provide for all of them gadgets to do that. You have to buy data, you have to pay school fees in addition. And all these things come to add up to uh, our stress levels. 
So on, on the second one was on um, avenues for support. Um, I can talk for Ghana Psychological Association. When we realized that stresses were compounding, we had uh, some hotlines for, uh, to support people. We made it public and people, the calls that came were enormous. We also um, partnered with CORE and other groups to support the youth um, some, um, and some workers to uh, bring down the stresses or manage the stresses that come with um, COVID-19. So thank you very much. Um, now say I hope I've, I've answered your question. Yes, ma'am. But uh, the, the second one um, is um, what help is given to the perpetrators? I think. Okay, okay. What my, help is given to yeah, the perpetrators? Yeah, my little knowledge is that when people are arrested, yeah. in with court cases, uh, they are deemed to be unfit to the society and sure. people frown sure. on them a whole lot. So I'm asking, after they've been taken to the police station, court, what have you, what help are given to those people? Okay. So I, I looked at my presentation, I looked at the perpetrators and how they contribute to how victims are, are caught up in that uh, web of helplessness. Now, what I know, I'm not a lawyer, but what I know is that um, currently, like you said, we go to the police station, we probably incarcerate them and, and, and that is it. But I think that with support from Mental Health Authority, our professor and other um, stakeholders, we need to push for um, that added support. So even if we are incarcerating them, they will come back into society. If there are existing mental health issues, they may be compounded even with the stresses in the, the um, prisons. And so we need to give added support, especially when we are bringing them out of uh, the prison. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mom. So grateful. Hello, Dr. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Joanna, for that elaborate response. Um, we are almost out of time, but one important question that I would ask, judging from the perspectives that has been provided, it is clear that mental health issues, cultural issues, sociological issues, all interlink to cause, affect, ritual and spousal abuse. Prof, I would want to ask you, based on all these considerations, is the mental health system, the Ghanaian mental health system, is it well resourced to deal with issues like this? And uh, if I should add, what kind of transformation does the system need to be able to address this thing? Because from listening to Dr. Joanna, we are all talking about empowerment, resource, empowerment, resource. So what kind of transformation does the system need to be able to help people deal with this problem? Well, thank you very much. In terms of resources and adequacy of resources, we certainly are not adequately resourced. But I would also not use that as an excuse to do nothing. From the discussion, we realize the interrelatedness, the multifactorial component of this issue, and not simply just mental, but it's multifaceted, uh, and we need to bring all these partners together. So partnership to me is a key word. Recognition of the existence of the problem. Now, I don't think anybody can play the ostrich anymore. We need to recognize, and we do now, recognize the existence of the problem. We need to recognize that it's coming from different angles. In fact, even our upbringing, and this was highlighted by one of the speakers, we need to recognize this and then build the necessary partnerships so that together we can bring all stakeholders on board and move forward. Maybe your question is who will take the lead. Mental Health Authority is prepared to take the lead in that line so that we list the various stakeholders who are required to be able to handle decisions. Legal component, how to make sure the laws work. In fact, identifying the specific laws, making sure that they are working, uh, the, um, the support system that was just highlighted, how do we provide the support system for victims, now, I must say there is one NGO that is working on this, ACT Foundation. It supports uh, victims of such violence that's even money, money to, to survive it. 
But we need to bring such NGOs and other such agents, or even create more, so that we can have a collective interconnectedness, so we can get a solution. Many of the authority is prepared to take the lead in that line, but eventually what I'm saying is that partnership building is what will take us there. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you very much, Prof. Ben, are you on? Ben, we're born. Uh, yes, Dr. Atta, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Um, and, and I very uh, commend you for, for this, this session and, and starting these sessions. I really hope that it's not just going to be this and that there will be many more that would follow. Um, I, I, I wanted to just make a quick comment um, and, and a question that probably challenged to, to, to all of us here um, about um, the, uh, the data that, uh, and the quality of the data. And I think uh, the sociologist uh, did mention that, um, uh, that when it comes to data, Ghana, we're struggling a bit. And I just wondered that whether we could potentially um, begin to think about investing in data so that we can ask the appropriate questions about what really um, are the, 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 the clear causes. I mean, to TEDs, yes, you can attribute it to mental health conditions, um, particularly for, for perpetrators. But do we know about the victims? And do we know about what really are the causes for people to remain in such uh, ascetic um, relationships? Um, and also for the ritual, even the ritual, the ritual um, uh, matters. I think we, it would be useful to commission some studies to try to isolate what the actual causes are for, for this kind of condition in Ghana or this behavior um, that we are seeing in Ghana. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is in terms of solutions and um, you know, low hanging fruits that we probably want to think about is to begin to think about what can we embed in our uh, routine health system to detect I know the whole thing about this whole thing is about early detection and flagging up stuff. How can we do that? And uh, with the mental health authority uh, providing that leadership with Ghana Health Services that we can begin to have systems in place in our primary health care where we can have ways of detecting these when they see issues when they come up. People turn up at their primary health care and probably they are going through quite a difficult time. And this could be one way of just flagging this up and then obviously providing. The, the, the interventions. And there are lots of interventions that are really good at um, working on these things. So thank you very much, Dr. Otto. Yes, thank you very much, Ben, for that input. I, I think that uh, we are almost at the end of the session. I would ask Prof to respond to Ben what you said, but clearly it's about research and about early detection, just like Prof, Prof did say. What we need, mental health, system needs its partnership. But I will not talk much. I'll allow, I'll allow Prof to respond to that. Prof, please, can you pick it up? Uh, thank you very much. If you don't mind, I've seen a hand, that, a hand which has not talked yet. So uh, Charlotte, if you could, really could give her the chance to make a submission. OK. OK. Madam Charlotte, Charlotte are you there? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm here. Thank you very much. And uh, it's, yeah, it's been a lovely presentation. Um, my my comments. Uh, uh, to one on the perpetrators. To the best of my knowledge, not much is done for perpetrators or any criminals in terms of psychological uh, rehabilitation. Most often is the hands-on practical skills and tools learning that is done in the prisons. And even that is not, uh, <laughs> is not up to scratch. So in fact, we, we just um, incarcerate them, demonize them, and throw them into jail. But um, most of these offenses are either misdemeanors or second degree felonies. And so uh, in a space of um, 10 years, seven years, five years, they are back into the society. And they, they come with the same and even added on psychological issues to perpetrate even more. And so uh, at this forum with so many of us, policy and mental health being here, I believe we need to um, think about how to deal with the perpetrators as well. And also with these children who committed the ritual murder, what has been done for them psychologically? Once a person commits such a heinous offense, that person himself 
becomes, uh, uh, let me put it, less human or dehumanized. How are we helping these children gain, reconnect with their human selves and, and uh, uh, help them deal with um, some social and other psychological issues that might have uh, gone wrong for them to get to this point? You know, because I, I heard that one of them had been incarcerated before as a, as a juvenile and was out and had gone ahead to commit the, uh, another offense. How do, we, how do we break the cycle for them? So I think uh, this is a good beginning, but I think we need to go a step further uh, from here to, to attend to the perpetrators and attend to the victims as well. The, the psychological issues that don't help them to be able to assert themselves and to stand up for uh, their rights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charlotte. So, Prof, back to you. I think that now you, are going, you have to lump it all up. Ben talked about research, collecting data, the, the resources to early detect, and Charlotte is also talking about resources to help perpetrators as well as victims. And I know that it comes back to what you earlier mentioned about partnership, because we need partnership to do all this. Stuff. So I would leave that to you to respond to the, the two of them, then we can bring the session I, to a close. Again, with the indulgence of participants, uh, Victus, Victus wants to make, a, a director of the mental authority wants to make an input, and I think it could be crucial. So if you allow Victus, or he's withdrawn the hand, Victus, have you withdrawn the hand? He has withdrawn the hand. Okay, Victus, right. can no. you come back? Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> okay, Victus is back. Okay, Victus, go okay. ahead. Good afternoon. Victus, go ahead. Okay, your, your network is a problem. All right, so, yeah. Um, and we are please. Uh, Victus is on. The network Victus, is on. Victus, go ahead. Okay. Uh, okay, sorry, never mind. Victus, you go will ahead. have another opportunity at some other time. But clearly, uh, this has been a very interesting session, a very interesting program. And I am particularly Sorry, am I on now? Yes, you are on. You, am you, I being you hit? briefly. Yes, you stepped out. Sorry yes, about the about second. So sorry about the network. It just got okay. Okay. So yes, I'm saying that this has been a very interesting submission, and um, uh, I am particularly impressed with the submissions of all the the speakers, the speakers, the participants, the questions that have come contributions, and I particularly noted the webinar format that we should use. And I think, yeah, we'll look at that. So it's really been wonderful. We've looked at psychological or mental health issues like depression, paranoid schizophrenia, delusional disorder, bipolar, substance use and alcohol disorders. All these are factors that might precipitate spousal uh, uh, murders. Personality disorders, all these we need to recognize. You also mentioned sadomasochism and learned helplessness. These are issues that are really um, causative factors or trigger factors we need to look at. You've looked at social, cultural factors, upbringing, home factors. If somebody picks up a behavior at home and grows with it, he learns to understand that this is how my parents live, so I can also live that and perpetuate abuses on my partner. We need to look at that. We also will need to look at the vulnerability of our women or our uh, I don't know what is giving rise to the instability here. But then our religious bodies and our elders who might say, no, it's a taboo, stay on, stay in, stay in. We also will need to look at that. If it's time for somebody to walk out, that will need to be said. But of course, we need to look at the timing so we don't unnecessarily encourage divorce and walking out when it could be mended, but you also don't honestly encourage people to stay in 
until death results. All these are factors. Sexual refusal, pathological jealousy amongst men, who would therefore uh, well decide to inflict uh, uh, such abuses on our women. Gender issues, these have been highlighted. We also will need to build, uh, well, uh, the media also now have a role to play. The media and society generally glamorizing shortcut wealth. Glamorizing shortcut wealth. And this is an issue that we need to recognize. We need to commission research studies. And I will say not only commission, but researchers must also voluntarily recognize the need for research in these areas. So together we will have data, solid data, to know the patterns and uh, the epidemiology of these factors is very important. We need early recognition of these trigger factors so we can, we can solve them, that's very important. We need to create support system. It's not enough to identify problems, identify victims, but we don't have support system for them. That's very important. So we need to create that. Uh, example has been given of the alleged or the, the teenage alleged killers. How are we doing to support them? There has been an instance of recidivism. That is, one of them has been to prison and come back and is you know, perpetrating this offense. How do you look at that? So these are issues and many more. This I'm only uh, summarizing. And if you can get all this and put them together and see how you can build a partnership, then we know we are getting a hand on the problem. Otherwise, who knows? In the next two, three years, it's really going to escalate to a point that we can handle. So on that note, I would say thank you very much. It's been really, really insightful and very interesting. And I'm sure those who, uh, a point came that he hopes it won't be a nine-day wonder. I can promise you that it won't be a nine-day wonder. This is the second one, and we continue. Every month, we intend to have it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you very much, Prof, for that uh, summary. I mean, you've said it all. To cap it all, we need partnership to get this thing done. Because the problem, is, I would say, is intertwined. Spiritual, religious, cultural, economic, psychological. It's intertwined like a knot. You need to untie all of them. And we as an institution, we cannot do all of that. We need other organizations. That is where the partnership comes in. So on behalf of Mental Health Authority, on behalf of the Chief Executive, on my own behalf, I'd want to thank you very much and to re-echo what Chief just said. Every month, we are going to do a program on mental health. And next month, trust me, God willing, when you are all alive, we will do another program. Thank you all for joining, and we'll see you at the end of next month. Thank you. The program has ended. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Welcome. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Dr. joining. Thank you for Dr. Uh, Mankwa, I'll be Dr. Okay. Mankwa, can you hear me? I'll be coming for yeah. personal TV. Um, Dr. Malu, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All God bless you. Uh, okay, I drove the kiss. That's good. Cool. Okay. Uh, hello, Dr. Thank you. It's Dr. next time. Dr. 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 Thank you very much. Health, and maybe the president himself. Tamanqua here. Yeah, you know. Dr. Mankwa, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Mr. Kibble. I can hear you. I, I, I'll be coming for personal tutelage. You are welcome. You are most welcome. Uh, hello, Dr. Yawat. Hello, hello, Dr. Mankwa. Hello, Doctor. Dr. Mankwa, we are being called. Yes, hello, Mr. Yafi. Yes, Mr. Yafi. Yes, oh, thank Lafie. you very much for, 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 yeah, for uh, giving us this education on this mental issue. We will have to invite we will be inviting you to uh, 97 so that those who are give them uh, you bring them back. <laughs>
All right. Thank you very much. When you, when you send the invitation, I'll do my best to honor it. Not Not Good afternoon. Yeah, are you there? You're being called. Yes, Dr. Fletcher, I can hear you. Dr. Fletcher, I can hear you. Dr. Tetter, please unmute yourself. I cannot hear you. Yeah, I'm saying congratulations to you and your, your and prof. I think the program is very insightful and uh, um, it must be continued. And next, I remember that you serve lunch virtually. <laughs> <laughs> very good point. <laughs> well noted. OK. <laughs> Well noted. Uh, bro, 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 I've heard you very well. well That's noted. right. Well, well, well noted. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much for your, for your kind words. Thank you very much for your kind words. Hello. Yeah, I got it. One of <laughs> uh, uh, Prophet Elisha, why are you saying something? Okay. <laughs> Prophet Elisha, why are you saying something? Hello, Doc. Thank you so much. The program is so insightful. Thank you very much for your kind words. Thank you very much for your kind words. Yeah, only that I didn't join early. So I promise that maybe God will it next month. All right. All right. We'll look forward to seeing you. Oh, okay. Please, is there any upcoming program? Uh, the next upcoming program will be at the end of next month, a similar virtual seminar. Okay. 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 Okay, thank you very much. So, so the flyer will be shared just like how this one was doing. It will be on our social media handles too. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I, I received the invite for a friend. Yeah, I'm not on the platform. So I received the invite for a friend on our counselor platform. Mm. We, 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 shared, we shared it all over the place. So happy okay. that you somehow got it. That's fine. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yes, 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 yes.